Hey, uh, got a couple of really cool things, but before I do share my cool things with you, I just want to say y'all look good. And how are you feeling tonight? I hope you're doing okay. Y'all doing all right? Okay, good, good, because, man, the church started off good this morning. Like at the 9 a.m. service, some guy walked in. This is before church even starts. I hugged him, and I think he must have been baking biscuits at home. He smelled amazing. <clears throat> so I, I was like, I want to hug you some more. Anyway, it's been a good day, and uh, got a couple of our favorite things coming up that I just want to tell you about. Number one is not, not in two days on Tuesday, but the following week, the week of Thanksgiving, that Tuesday night before Thanksgiving is always Lisa and I's favorite service that we do every year, and it's the Thanksgiving worship and testimony night, and the, the house gets packed. You need to come out that night, and we just sing some songs, and people share their stories of what God has done in the last year that they're thankful for, and it's amazing. How many of you have ever been to one of our Thanksgiving ones? Yeah? It's been so good. Here's the deal. You can participate in that if you want to share your story. You can just email it in to... Uh, amen at newvintagechurch.com, and uh, we'll, we will get in touch with you and see if we can add it to that. What we don't uh, want to do is we don't want to share stories about how your grandma got healed in 1924. That's awesome. <clears throat> We're looking for stories that happened to you and happened in this last 12 months, and we want to celebrate every year on that kind of stuff, so that's good. And then the other thing is we're in this generosity series and we've designated where our money's going to go at the end of the year. And uh, half of the money from next weekend's bonus offering is going to go to help all of our outreach efforts that we're doing with Lincoln Elementary School. And God is opening up a huge door at Lincoln Elementary. And here's a couple of the items uh, that we're participating with them in. We're doing Thanksgiving bite-to-go backpacks for the kids as they head back to their uh, places they live that don't have food. And we're going to do that for 40 families. Come on, isn't that amazing? Like we're going to feed 40 families through the school district. We're going to do a, a big prep party that people can get involved with and in helping to buy the food or pack the food. We're doing adopt a classroom because there's a lot of teachers that are actually spending their own money to buy the snacks because uh, they don't have them. And so we're like, no, we're going to take care of that and help the teachers out. We're doing lunch and breakfast buddies on a weekly basis, and you can sign up for that. And some of the other back-to-school things we'll do in January if you're interested in helping with that stuff, go to the information counter right after service tonight and give them your information. They'll contact you with the details about how you can get involved. And I love that our church is doing this. You guys are the best. Come on, give yourself a big hand because you're doing some huge work with some great people. That's amazing. I want to um, share this tonight, this thought that a generous soul is, a gen is generous in all of life. Like, uh, have you ever met people that just come across all around generous? You just like those kind of people, right? They just seem warm, and they just care about you, and they will go out of their way for you, and, and, and we love that. But there's something to it that a, a generous person, a lot of times people think about generosity, and they think it's just about money. But really, when you become generous with your money, God begins to do a work, and you become generous in every area of your life, and you become a generous soul, and that's what we want to be is people who are like a great representation of who Jesus is. And I'm going to read a story to you tonight from the Bible about a, a man named Barnabas. And there's this great place in the Bible in the book of Acts. And it tells a story about what God was doing in the church and how it led to revival. And a lot of it had to do with generous souls. And in particular, it names one of the guys and his name's Barnabas. And uh, I'll read it, but it's on the screen and you can follow along if you'd like says, the apostles testified powerfully to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and God's great blessing was upon them all. Let me stop on that sentence for a minute and just say this, that one of the greatest things you could ever do in your life in return for what Jesus has done for you is to powerfully testify that God is alive in your life and to tell people because when Jesus does something so good inside of your life, it should come out in your words to somebody somewhere at some time. There should be something inside you that goes, listen, uh, I, I, wanna, I can't wait to share with you. And I, I got to just say, like, I get the microphone a lot because I, I'm, I get to speak. But, like, Jesus has actually done really great stuff in Matt Moult's life. And it's a privilege and a pleasure to be able to tell people, hey, God is not dead. Jesus is actually alive. And I know it because of what he's done inside of me and what he's done that I've seen him do through me, and I've seen actual miracles and real things happen, and God has changed and transformed me. And I want to just testify as powerfully as I can 
about Jesus and that he is resurrected and alive right now. And I, I just think there's something great that happens when, when God touches your life. It makes you want to spill that over because of his generosity towards us. It says this, there was no needy people among them because those who owned land or houses would sell them and bring the money to the apostles to give to those that were in need. Now, I want you to think about this. This is radical generosity. This is not like the buckets getting passed and you got a bonus and you know you're getting a $10,000 a year raise next year. You're like, you know what? I'm going to throw in a 20 tonight. Like help the poor people of the city out through the church. Now, this is a radical generosity where you're like, man, I got three rental places and I'm going to sell one of those and give all of that money to the church to do some good work in the sea. Like that's the kind of radical generosity that was happening here. And I'm telling you, when Jesus begins to invade people's lives, people respond with radical generosity in their life. And it was crazy. Like this is not normal. And then it goes into a particular, it says, for instance, there was Joseph. Now, that's the name his mama gave him. His name was Joseph, but one of the, and one of the, uh, he was one of the apostles that was nicknamed uh, Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. He picked up a nickname along the way. Now, I've been called words and phrases kind of like this before in my life. I've been called son of certain things. I don't know about how nicknames you picked up along the way. But I kind of like this, that they're like, you know what? You're a son of encouragement. You know, that's a good one. And this brother was so encouraging to people that this nickname stuck. And so they didn't call him by his birth name, but they called him by his nickname, Barnabas. He was from the tribe of Levi, which just means he was Jewish. And he came from the island of Cyprus. He sold a field that he owned, and he brought the money to the apostles. And so our introduction to this man named Barnabas is through this radical act of generosity where he goes, man... God has so touched my life that I'm literally selling off what I own and going to give all of that because I'm bought into what God is doing. And it's this incredible story. Now, Barnabas' story doesn't stop there. When you go through the Bible, Barnabas' story is, is he's all throughout what happens in the first century church. And it's an incredible thing, but we're introduced to him that way. And I love this idea of radical giving and radical living. But here's the point I want to make with you tonight is that Barnabas was not just radical in his generosity with his cash. He, was a, he became a generous soul. Like God did things with him in every aspect of his life. And I'm going to show that to you here in just a minute. There's a great quote by one of the old ancient preachers 150, 200 years ago named John Wesley. And he said this, do all the good you can by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, all the times you can. To all the people you can, as long as you ever can. Can I get a witness? Come on, somebody. That's a good. <clears throat> Man, I, I think that's wonderful. When God does a work in our life, it flows out to every area of our life. So let me talk about Barnabas for just a few minutes. And then I'm going to share with you seven ways that we can live and give generously in our life. Besides just money, it's an incredible thing. In chapter 4, we read uh, in the book of Acts, we read about Barnabas' financial gifts. In chapter 9, it's this great story where Barnabas meets a young man named Saul. Now, I'm going to refer to him as Paul because he changes his name to Paul. Paul goes on to become the greatest missionary of all time. He writes most of the Bible that we have today. He becomes a prolific church planter. And the reason that Paul gets on the scene is largely due to the influence of a man named Barnabas. Because Paul, before he was a Christian, he was killing Christians. And then he gets converted and stops killing Christians and becomes one. But nobody trusts this guy. And Barnabas meets him and hears his story and goes, you know what? I know that everybody's scared of you, but I'm bringing you to church. Come on. And I'm sure Paul was like, I ain't going to church. Like, everybody hates me. Like, I killed people. And, and Barnabas is like, no, you're going to be fine. And uh, you're going to sit with me, and I'm going to introduce you to the pastors and, and, the, and everybody and all my friends. And we're going to go out to Applebee's afterwards. And, and, and he brings them into church. And so here, Paul, who nobody trusts, Barnabas has got his arm around him and goes, you know what? Jesus did something cool in this brother's life. And, and you watch. He's going to be something big, and, and I want to support him. And he, was a, he, was, he had encouraging eyes. He had a generosity to know that if God could change a person like me, Barnabas, God can get a hold of a man like Paul. And let me just say this, that we want to be a Barnabas kind of church, that we're not viewing people that are in our church right now 
with the way they're acting right now or the way their reputation from the past is. We want to have eyes to see what can God do with this person. We want to be go, man, you could be, you might be named Saul right now, but I think you're going to be like a Paul. You're going to do something amazing. And I'm going to introduce you to all my friends. I'm going to talk good about you. And I'm going to get you a platform, get you on stage because God's doing something good. And that's how we got to be with people and have a generous heart like that. In chapter 11, there's this place where revival breaks out among non-Jewish people. And the people in Jerusalem are like, we need to check that out and see if it's legit. And they send Barnabas as one of the people. And it says that Barnabas gets there and he finds out that it's legit, that people are really turning their lives over to Jesus and following him. It says that he celebrated because he was just an encouraging kind of guy. In chapter 11, he's able to handle a financial gift. This is historically now a couple years later. And they decide, some people say, hey, we need to take an offering for all the people in Jerusalem that are being persecuted for their faith. And so they collect a large sum of money, and they're like, who can we trust? And they give it to Paul and to Barnabas to take it back there. And one of the things that happens is when you're honest and have integrity with your money, because money's black and white. It's either this or, or it's not this. You either have money or you don't. But when, when you cheat and cut corners and when you treat money wrong and you lie about what you have or what you don't have, like God notices that kind of stuff. But this guy, Barnabas, earned trust because he had put all his chips on the table and said, I'm in financially. I'm giving to this. And he showed himself trustworthy in life. So he was one of the people who was able to have the joy of carrying this wheelbarrow load of money back to help take care of people. I'm telling you, when God gets a hold of your life with even your money and begins to influence you in your financial life, God can trust you with bigger and better things in the future. In chapter uh, 14, he gets to experience a miracle that God does. Listen, this is Barnabas's generous life. He's out on a missions trip preaching with Paul, and there's a dude in a city who the Bible records it this way and says that this man was crippled since the day he was born. And it adds this phrase, he had never walked his entire life. And so you can imagine this man whose feet were all tangled up, had never really gotten up on his own power at all, never been able to walk. And somehow as they're walking by all the needs of the city, the Holy Spirit prompts them to stop and pray for this guy. And so they do. They say, in Jesus' name, because Jesus is a healer, we're praying to you, Jesus, to heal this man right now. And the man is healed and his legs and feet straighten out. And he gets up and starts walking around. And the whole town knows this guy's story and can hardly believe it. And I'm telling you that when you're generous as a person, it overflows into every area of your life. And you might just get to see a miracle or two in your day before it's all over if you follow Jesus like these guys did. In chapter 15, I'm almost done with Barnabas' life, but in chapter 15... An interesting turn of events happens. So here Barnabas is responsible for Paul's rise to fame, if you will, and for sure famous in God's eyes. And they have a disagreement, Barnabas and Paul. And the fight is over this. Bar uh, Barnabas says, hey, we're going on this next trip, and I want to take this guy, John Mark. And Paul goes, I don't trust him. He bailed out on us, and uh, he doesn't have good character or whatever. And Barnabas, who has, is an encourager and sees people not where they're at, but where they're going to be, just like he did for Paul, he says, no, I like John Mark, and I'm going to take him with me on my trip. Then, Paul, you take whoever you want, but I'm going to go find another Paul. I'm going to find John Mark. I'm going to take him with me. And he takes John Mark with him, and they go on a trip, and they see God do all kinds of great stuff. Listen, when God gets a hold of your life, it affects not just your life, but how you view everybody around you. And some of you have been in this room, and you're like John Mark, and you maybe blew it in your life. Maybe you made some big mistakes. Maybe you lost an important relationship in your life. Maybe you sinned in ways that everybody knows, and, like, you had to get off of certain, uh, you know, social media, and, like, you feel like I could never get a start again. I want you to know that God sees you like John Mark and Barnabas, and is going, I could give you another chance. I can fix this. I can help you and restore you. And let me just tell you, at New Vintage Church, you're in good company. All of us here, including the guy holding the mic, have had a second, third, and fourth chance in life because of after failures. And if God can do it in me, God can do it in your life. And I love this about Barnabas. He's a generous soul. And in chapter 15, the final thing that we see in the book of Acts about Barnabas' life is he gets to go back 
on a missionary trip, and he's sent to a place called Cyrus. If you remember the scripture that we read, this is where Barnabas is from. He's from the island of Cyrus. Cyprus. Got that wrong. I was mixing my wrappers and islands. I don't know what happened in my mind. He goes back to Cyprus. And I think that one of the things that God will do in our lives sometimes is when we go, God, I want to just be as generous as I can be like you've been to me. God will lead us on a miracle journey, and sometimes that journey will take us all the way back around to our hometown. And that could be like literally the Tri-Cities, or it could be like, like, your, like your home, like all the family coming over on Thanksgiving, crazy Uncle Johnny. And, and, and sometimes when you go full circle, it's a reminder point where you go, oh, my gosh, God's done so much in my life. Look at where he's brought me. I'm not where I, I, I want to be, but, man, when I look at last time I was here, I was a different person. And sometimes when God brings you back to a place, you get to see how God has changed you. And now you get to share the goodness of God with people from your hometown, from your family. And some of you need to be watching for those opportunities at your Thanksgiving football extravaganza and your family get-togethers. And God will take some of you all the way around and you get to share the generosity of God. Listen, generosity doesn't start with us. It starts with God because the Bible says that he was so rich in his love towards us. And his salvation was a gift to us that we couldn't buy and we couldn't earn. The Bible even says it this way. It says that we can love one another because God first loved us. Like he gave to us. And when somebody gives to you something so overwhelming, you don't even know what to do. And you're sitting in church for the first couple weeks and you're just crying through the songs and going, God, I don't know how I got here, but I'm so grateful. And you just are overwhelmed with goodness. You start to go, I should be more like you. And you start to become generous. We can love other people because God first loved us. Generosity starts with him. And I love that. A generous soul is generous in all of life. Come on. It's amazing. I want to uh, tell you about intentions for a minute. Um, I love good intentions. Do you love having good intentions? It's easy to think positive thoughts. And um, I was doing some research on good intentions. And is anybody excited about your New Year's resolutions coming up here in just a little bit? Some of you are like, yeah, more kale and quinoa, right? And, and, you're like, and you're like, no, I want to go back to hugging the man that smells like biscuits. <laughs> like, I'm getting ready for holiday eating. No, but then you're going to feel bad and you won't be able to see straight because your eyes will be puffy. And you'll need to eat more kale and quinoa. And even if you don't eat quinoa, it's fun to say. Everybody say it. Go ahead, quinoa. It just sounds so awesome. Anyway, my point is this, is that everybody makes New Year's resolutions and has good intentions on January 1. But I did some research in the app called Foursquare. They track where people go. And they did a research, and they came up with a day, and it's literally called Fall Off the Wagon Day. And they can track where people check in to gyms compared to when that dives off, and at the same time, those same people, when the ramp up (laughs) starts at Burger King and Five Guys and Pietro's Pizza, right? And so they can check that, and they said that the big day is around February 15th, and people just give up. And listen... People's good intentions just don't last that long. Let me tell you about good intentions in my life. And I'm just going to be kind of transparent and real for a few minutes. You okay with that? So back in August or September, I was really excited because um, Disney had announced that they were going to launch the Mandalorian series. And if you don't know what that is, these are not the droids you're looking for. So just (laughs) go with me for a minute. But it's this Star Wars series. It was going to be on the new Disney Plus app. And I was so excited about it. And I literally got so excited that when I saw the date was November 12th and it was a Tuesday, I'm like, I got on the app that we have that reports to Jill and I chose the day off as a vacation day so I could watch The Mandalorian all day. And then as it got closer, I realized it's not going to be streamed like Netflix. They're going to do, you know, one a week. So I was like, okay, don't need to panic and take the whole day off. I could watch it when I get home on Tuesday night. And I had told Alejandro and Austin, because we're super fans, we're like, guys, mark this on your calendar, Tuesday night, November 12th. This is two and a half months ago. We're going to watch The Mandalorian. We're like, oh, we're just excited. And we're doing Wookiee growls and all that, right? And we're just (laughs) pumped. And so as it's gotten closer, I was reading articles on my Apple News feed about it and all the the behind-the-scenes stuff that I could get. And I'm like, oh, what's it going to be like? And uh, so then I remember on Monday, the 11th, I was like, how does this thing download onto my Apple TV streaming thing or whatever? How do I do that? So I was reading articles, and they're like, oh, it's going to launch at 9 a.m. on Tuesday. I was like, okay, I could get up early and maybe, like, get it 
going so it can be downloading while I'm at work. And then at approximately exactly 11.39 p.m. on Monday night, I see a new news article that says, alert, Disney Plus is now available for, for download. And I was like, Lisa, we're in bed. I grab her arm. I'm like, babe, it's like a miracle. It's early. And I go out into the living room, turn on the Apple TV, and I download the Disney Plus, sign in, and I'm like, is the man, and I scroll down to the Mandalorian, and I'm like, it's there. You know, I'm like elf. You know, I'm so excited. Santa! And I'm so like, and I go back in with my iPad, and I download it, and I'm like, babe, it's like God is alive, and he loves me. It's Monday night. I get to watch it early. And she says, you promised Alejandro and Austin you'd watch it tomorrow night. And I said, I will watch it again with them, but I'm going to watch it now. And so I put in my headphones, and I watched it, and I was just like, this is awesome. <laughs> On Tuesday, I come into the office, and I feel dirty. I have to face them, and there's shame. And I'm like, oh, you know. And so I kind of break the news, to, you know. And I was like, so this is an example of how not to be generous, okay? That's what that story is about. Episode two came out Friday. I have not seen it. I'm watching it tomorrow night with my boys. So I just want to say, I'm like, God is working in my life. But here's the, here's the deal. A lot of times, this is what happens. When generosity happens to us, when, when bonus extra comes into our life, our first thought is like, this is all for me. Oh, I get to eat this. I get to consume this. I get to, this is for me and my benefit. But generosity is actually... Uh, causes everything in your life to change where things that happen cause you to go, this is going to be so great. Who can I share this with? And that's what generosity does to us is it causes us to be givers. And I want to have great intentions, but when it comes to generosity, actions always supersede intentions. Come on, I don't want to have drop-off day in my generosity, fall off the wagon day. I want to be a consistent, generous, I want to become the cool, coolest 95-year-old someday, right? They'd be like, that old guy is so awesome. He gives us candy and prays for us. Like, I want to be a generous soul. Don't you want to be a generous soul, even though you want to watch Mandalorian? All right. I mean by watching it early. Let me talk to you about the seven ways to be generous, and I think this is going to be so inspiring to some of us here. Because I read this book by a guy named Brad Formsma, and he writes a book, and it's called I Like Giving. And he talks about all these different ways that giving and generosity can happen. And I was so changed by this, and it was challenging me. And man, as I'm, as I'm sharing this stuff with you tonight, you need to know that I'm not, I'm not an expert in this. I would consider myself a generous person, but this kind of stuff is, is I'm, I'm preaching it with you. Like, this is rocking me, and it's changing me, and causing me to... Look at my life. Here's, the, here's one way that you can live generously. Number one is thoughts. And, and you can have generosity in your thoughts. A lot of times in what we think about, everything that we think about is about me and my life. And what if we just intentionally, like tonight, when you go home after Applebee's with your friends or whatever, and you're laying down in bed, what if you took a moment and go, I want to think what could I do for somebody else? And you just put some thought power of generosity of how could I live this week not just for me but for somebody else? I'm telling you that it, it's hard to do, and, but it's something that I believe that we can do. And you can, God can start to give you world-changing ideas when you allow him to be a part of your thought process. And go, God, what could you do with my life? How can I think about this differently? I experienced this um, the other uh, week because Lisa and I went to Havana Cafe. Uh, it's a Cuban restaurant in uh, Pasco on Lewis Street. It's amazing. And if you have not gone, you need to go and get the empanadas, get the tostones, get the uh, arroz con pollo and the arroz con uh, frijoles negros. And you know, come on, gloria a Dios. I mean, but... Um, just all of it. It's so good. <laughs> the little coffee that comes in like a communion cup size. And you're like, oh, it's so good. Do it slower, Matt. I can't. It's so small. Anyway, I digress. The point is that I'm there and I had heard on the radio that Havana Cafe was going to do this food, like feeding Thanksgiving meals to the public on Thanksgiving Day. And literally they're doing that 
a week from Thursday. And so on Thanksgiving Day, they're going to open up the restaurant at noon, go to 4 o'clock. They want to do 500 plates. And, it, and, and so I was talking to the owner about it, and he said, yeah, it's not like just for homeless people, but for just people who just wanted, maybe don't have family here or whatever. We just wanted to open the doors, and the community has been so good to us, we wanted to give back. And we just decided we're going to do that. I'm like, this is incredible. I'm thinking, I'm preaching on generosity. And this, I said, so tell me, tell me what. He goes, you won't believe it. He goes, pastor, he goes, we started talking about this. And the company that we buy our food from heard about it. And they said, you know what? We love what you're doing. We're going to donate all the food for your event. <laughs> then Coca-Cola comes in to restock. They hear about it. And they said, hey, we love this. We're going to give you all the drinks for free for that day. And then volunteers started signing up and going, hey, we're going to come and help serve the food because you're going to be packed out. And I'm like, listen, when you start being generous in your thoughts and thinking, what can I do? God opens up generosity and inspires lots of people. So we need to have generous thoughts. Second way to show generosity and live it out in your real life beyond your intentions is with your words. Now, listen, this is hard for us. And if I was to say, hey, you need to be more generous with your words, some of you are so angry with somebody, you're like, oh, I'll be generous with my words. I'm going to give them a little extra, if you know what I'm saying. It's not what I mean. <laughs> what I mean is that what if you were generous in encouragement like Barnabas? What if you began to tell people the good you see in them and what you see about their future? And, and what if you began to, like, look at people differently and go, I want to I wanna just be generous verbally with you and tell you what an amazing friend you are and I know you've been through a rough patch and you know and you begin to just speak life I'm telling you that generosity that way means a lot because most of us are going through life and everybody's cutting everybody down and so we're just like fire backwards to try to survive but what if we decided not to be like that we decided we're going to be we're going to give more than is expected with our words that's what generosity means to give more than what's expected I think it'd be amazing a personal way that this has affected me is with um, Instagram. And, and here's what I mean by that. I, Instagram, like I don't care how many followers I have or anything like that, but it became kind of about me. And what would happen is I would use my personal Instagram account sometimes to repost a church event to try to get everybody that sees it to go to the church event. And it was about like promoting what I believe in or whatever. And then sometimes I'm scrolling through my feed, which is an interesting way that they call it my feed, like it's selfish. And I would be seeing people like posting about their workout personal best or their, you know, their potty training their kid or, you know, something. And I'd be like, yeah, I want to see some Star Wars stuff or, you know, churchy stuff or whatever. And it was like God spoke to me and goes, I want you to slow your scroll. And instead of being interested about what only interests you, Pastor Matt, what if you actually got interested in what other people are posting? And I'm like, wow. So I started like going, okay. And I'm not on Instagram all the time. I mean, you know, but like I'll scroll through and I'll try to stop. And I want to be like, come on, that's awesome that you got that flower. That's great that you potty trained so-and-so. That's, you know, and I'm proud of you. And I just thought I can be generous with my words. Let me tell you the last uh, few. Uh, money is one way we can be generous for sure. And I think that money, when you give money away, when you give money to the church, when you give it to somebody in need, it actually softens your heart and causes you to become more like Jesus. You become dependent on God supplying for you instead of going, I did this, I made this, this is mine. You start to go, like what Austin so powerfully preached last weekend, I want God's blessing to not just come to me, but to go through me to other people. And giving money away matters to God. And I think that we need to have a, uh, an, 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 a view of money that says, God, you own everything I've got. And what you want me to give, I'm willing to give at any moment in time. Because that is what generosity is. And some people are like, oh, well, I started giving, you know, a percentage to the church of my, every time I get a check. I, maybe you are a tither, you give 10%. And, and I, let me just say this, that that's actually... It's pretty clear in Scripture that that was a baseline of obedience for people following Christ all through Scripture. That's not that uncommon. Generosity is giving above what's common. And it's like going, hey, I'm going to give this much, and I'm going to be willing to give anything else that God asks of me. And that's where generosity can really blossom in our life. 
Now, our church, we're not doing a giving series. We did it last year. We're going to do it next year. I don't do it because we need to raise funds. I actually, as your pastor, believe that giving accelerates growing in our lives. And so I want to give you an opportunity to grow. And some of you are stuck in your life. And there's something that you just can't get past. And you're like, just so focused on you. And maybe cash is the key to unlock the door of the house of generosity for you. And you go, you know what? I just need to start trusting God with my actual money. Money is so powerfully tied to who we are because it's what we do for a living. It's how we do most of our time, and it's, it's what we do. It's, it, money is in everything. And so when we begin to allow God to take a part of that from us, it really is maybe one of the most tangible spiritual thermometers of our life. And I just want you to grow, and that's why I'm sharing these things with you. Our culture lives like all our money is our money. And I was writing down some lyrics and like a poem, and I think this is kind of snappy, but it kind of captures the way I think our culture thinks about money. And so here's what I wrote. It goes, uh, I want it. I got it. I want it. I got it. You like my hair? Gee, thanks. Just bought it. I see it. I like it. I want it. I got it. You think that's good? I think that could go somewhere. I think it could become something. So, but we have this mindset of, some of you need to turn on the radio. You have no idea. What, but uh, we have this mindset that, like, I, I want it. And, and what if we were like, I want to give it. Like, what if that was our, our song? It would be wonderful. There's a powerful thing in uh, one of the most influential movies I've ever seen. It was Schindler's List, black and white movie made in the modern era about World War II and a man named Schindler, who was, I believe, half Jewish, worked in Germany, but because he was part German, he was able to stay working and he decided to use his influence and his money to pay for Jewish people to not be murdered. And so he would funnel them out and he did this one at a time and it was risky and at the end of the movie, this, which is a very long movie, he has this scene where he comes out, the war is now over, and there's all these Jews that survived because of Schindler's generosity with his money and what he did, and he's standing there, and he's, he's overwhelmed with emotion, and he's not like, oh my gosh, look at all the good I did. He's overwhelmed because he goes, I could have done so much more, and he's angry, and he pulls off a, a pin on his lapel, and he goes, this is gold, I could have sold this, I could have gotten one more. And I'm telling you that at the end of our lives, we're not going to be like, I'm so glad I upgraded to an iPhone 11 Pro and make monthly payments and got the better car with the sports package and bought another house and paid and put, went in debt for a vacation. We're going to regret that we didn't give more away because we're going to start to see the value of how dollars make a difference in the lives of other people. Money is a powerful thing. The fourth way that we can be generous in our life is with our influence. And, and there's a lot of young people in here, but all of us have influence at a certain level. Where you work, you have some influence. Where you go to school, you have influence. There are people in here that own businesses and, uh, a, you know, work for a, a business. And you have a stage, a platform. You have the ability to impact other people where you're at in your life. And one of the greatest things we can do is to actually be generous with our influence. Because what happens is we go, we get to a spot, we get a promotion and we kind of go, I want to protect that. And I got here because I found this great website for helping me with my sales or I listen to this podcast, help me get there. And we act like we're so completely self-built. And yes, you've got to work on your personal leadership and all those things. But we can get there and go, I climbed this ladder and I got to protect this position I'm in. When actuality is maybe God favored you and maybe God placed you in a place to give you influence and it wasn't just for you. Maybe you're to share your influence. Maybe you should connect somebody with a contact of somebody else that could help them succeed and grow in their life. Now, for me in my industry, I'm in the pastoring world, right? When, from day one, when, when our church was really just very, very small, when it first started, we had decided we wanted to be a generous church and help other churches in any way we could. And we did that in a lot of practical ways. But as our church has grown over time... That heart has never changed, but I have people come in, pastors, and we're sh sharing ideas over lunch or whatever, and they'll say, hey, pastor, how did you do this, or what did you do to grow that, or what's the best way to do this? And, and I have these 
thoughts in my head that I go, if I tell you how we did that on the website, if I tell you the way we do this, you might take that idea and maybe your church will grow faster than mine or maybe people will want to go to your church over mine. And I get these weird thoughts. And I've learned to instantly kill that thing and go, I'm going to tell you how to do it. I'm going to tell you how to do it better than we did it because now there's better information. And I'm going to pray for you that God would bless it in your church. And I'm going to, to just kill what's in my heart. We're going to sow money into your church from our church. And we've done this over and over again because that's how the kingdom wins. And it's like, man, can we, what if, what if, I don't know if this makes sense, but I want to share influence because I want the kingdom of God to win. I don't want me to win or us to win. I want the king, I want Jesus to win. Come on, somebody. Share your influence. Fifth one is time. You can be generous with your time. One of the things that I love about Barnabas is he actually spends his life going around and supporting and helping other people. And you know, in our lives, like where you're at in your, in your life, in your stage of life, in the place of work or school that you're at or whatever. Maybe you're an empty nester, but, man, you have time to give. And what if you decided I, could, I can be generous with my time? Like sometimes people in our church go to the hospital for something. And it's always good if people call the office and let us know because they feel like the church should know about that. But what if just you just went to the hospital and visited somebody and just sat with them for a couple hours and had some sugarless, tasteless jello and watched a 480 by 620 screen TV with them and just sat and held somebody's hand and just said, I'm going to be with you. You just take a nap. I'm going to just read. I'm going to just spend some time with you. And what if you just were like, I'm going to be generous that way. What if you were generous and said, you know what? I don't want my time to be all about me. So I'm going to like sign up after service for the outreaches. And I'm going to like go give some time and give up a a Saturday, it's my NCAA football day or whatever, and I'm going to actually go do something good for some people in the community. And what? here's a real test of Christianity. When your friend says, I'm moving, and they go, will you help me move? Hello. You donate that time, you're a real Christian. <laughs> but we just have to have a view that God could use our lives and our time. Number six, you can be generous with your attention. I think this is actually one of the most profound things that I learned when I was studying some of this stuff. Our whole culture is so phone focused that there's, a, there's an article that I just read yesterday out of, out of Silicon Valley where they're doing what's called dopamine fasts, where, where employees that are so on screens all the time, they're actually telling people like to unplug everything, to give your brain time to heal and rest from all the, but we are so on that. I'll tell you one of the greatest ways you can be generous as a Christ follower is that when you are actually having a conversation with somebody, you put your phone on silent and put it away. You can check your likes a little later and you just go, hey, I am here. We know when somebody's been fully present with us. And it means so much when somebody's look, looking us in the eye their shoulders are square. They're not looking over us to the next thing. They're like, I want to hear the details. And I'm telling you that you're going to blow people's minds. They're not going to be used to that. And for you to just give attention is a way of showing generosity that will matter to real people in their real life. And I think it's wonderful. And then the final one is stuff. Some of you need to get rid of uh, some, not get rid of stuff, but you should give stuff away that's meaningful. Now, don't come dropping off all your old clothes that don't fit and have stains. We don't want them. We don't have room for them. But you need to be strategic like that gentleman that Pastor Chris talked about with his car. And, and I think that there's going to be people who are going to go, I could sell this, but I'm going to give it away. I think there's going to be people like Barnabas that you're in, in our church that are so moved by what God has done in their life that they're literally going to sell property and buildings and give all the proceeds to what God is doing at the church. They're gonna go, I wanna just give this to you. I wanna give it away. There's gonna be some radical generosity with stuff that's gonna happen in our life. When I was in, um, you know, er, let me just say it like this, like how many of you all have a phone? Raise your hand if you do not own a cell phone. Right, so here's the point, is that, doesn't matter how new your cell phone is right now, 
in, in, ten, in five years, it won't even work anymore. Like it'll be so bad and so old. All the stuff that we're spending so much on right now is going to become junk in a decade. It's junk. Um, somebody had given us a, a Blu-ray DVD player, and it sat underneath my TV and never used it. And uh, they gave it to us a year and a half ago, and somebody was having a garage sale. I said, oh, here, take this and sell it. We don't use it. And the person goes, what would I do with this? Who would buy this? I said, somebody who uses Blu-ray. And, I, and they said, people, people stream everything on their iPads and their phones. Like, you don't need a Blu-ray player anymore. And I'm like, well, what do you want to, I, I didn't know what to do with this. I was like, this was so valuable at one time. I was like, do you want my cassette tapes too? Like, I didn't know what to do, you know? And I held on to that thing, but now it's, it's, it doesn't work for me. Like, we have stuff that one of the, one of the greatest things, and I, this is, I've got two stories to close with. I got to go to Romania. I've told that story before, but somebody had told me this, and I had forgotten about this. And so I'm not telling this to brag on me. I'm telling you to just you know, maybe inspire you. But when I was in Romania on a, on a trip as a teenager, it was one of the last days. We had like two days left on the trip before we were flying home to America. And I remember we were in a church service, and I was sitting down, and there was a kid that I had talked to, and, I, and he had his feet crossed, and I could see the bottom of his shoes, and it was completely worn out. And so I said to him after, I said, man, why don't you just get some other shoes? And he goes, what other shoes? And I looked down, I'm like wearing like new Adidas that I bought for this missions trip. So I took them off and I said, I want you to have these. So I can go home and I can go in socks for two days. But I can go home and I can buy some new shoes. And the, the guy was so moved by me giving him shoes that it was just like life changing for this guy. And he ended up coming back to me and he only had one photograph and he cut it in half and he gave me the picture of himself that's about this big he goes I want you to have this it's all I can give you but I want you and I was just like God help me to just not be such a jerk about all my stuff my, my favorite story on the, on the idea of stuff is uh, the Schrader boys in Vancouver, Washington Lisa and I, when we were 27, helped uh, Pastor Bob and Pastor Sue start City Harvest Church. And the Schrader boys came. They were in college. And I remember it was so awesome to uh, hang out with them. They were just fun and wild and crazy. But they loved Jesus. And they lived for snow days. They lived for when Vancouver would snow and, it, and the roads would ice over. Because they had this, like, really old station wagon. But they had snow tires. And it was really good on the snow and ice. And so what they would do is they would load up their car with tow cables jumper cables, hot water, bottled water, hot cocoa, and they would drive around looking for people who had slid off the road that needed, needed rescuing. And they're like, we can't do everything, but we got this old beat up car and we're gonna just spend, we're gonna just give, use that for somebody else's benefit. And they loved it. And it was just, they'd tell these awesome stories about how they would help people. And I just went, I wanna be like that. I wanna just... Like I told a guy today, I had bought a ladder. I bought one of those really cool fold-up ladders from Costco. It's called a Mini Max or something. I don't know what it's called. Mini Mouse? I don't know what it is. But it's, I remember buying it. And I was just like, as I was putting on my Christmas lights this year on, on Veterans Day, I just remember going, God, I love this ladder. And I just thought, so many people need a ladder once in a while. And I'm going to share my ladder with anybody that needs it. And you might laugh at that. It's kind of goofy. But like, could we just look at our stuff? And go, man, this isn't mine. I want to be generous. Come on, a generous soul is generous in all of their life. Last thing I'm going to tell you is this, that author Stephen Post said that somebody who practice, practices three kinds of, of these generosities every week, they live 10 times longer and they take half the medicine of other people. Think about that. Half the meds, and you live 10 years longer because generosity does something good for you. Like God put that in us for a reason, and I think it's wonderful. How many of you are inspired to be a little more generous in your life? Come on. I want to pray with you. I want to pray for you tonight. Jesus, I just so thank, thank you that I believe that you are here with us tonight. By the power of the Holy Spirit, 
you're here and you're changing our hearts and you're transforming us and you're causing us to look at our lives differently and I'm praying that you would, God, let us go way beyond intentions. God, cause us to be generous in our real life. Cause us to be so giving with our words and our attention and our time and our money and our stuff. God, our thoughts, give us Holy Spirit inspired thoughts. God, cause us to become like Barnabas who put it all on the table and said, I want my life to count for something bigger than myself. I want to give you an opportunity to receive the greatest gift that I ever got in my whole life. And I get to give, I don't get to give it to you, I get to tell you about it. And it's the fact that, man, my life was such a wreck without Jesus and just times when I wandered away from him, he was so good to me. And he always won me back. The Bible tells the story that God loved humanity so much that God gave his only son and comes to the planet and they murdered him which was so wrong the Bible says that by the power of the Holy Spirit God raised him from the dead to prove that he was the Messiah and the Lord of this planet and that is true and that matters and people have been preaching that for a long time saying hey if you'll put your trust not in yourself but in that man Jesus who is God's son He'll forgive you for every mistake you've made, give you a brand new start, and he'll make a difference in this life for you and in the afterlife. As we're in this moment of prayer, I wanna pray for people who came into this building tonight and have never prayed a prayer like that to say, Jesus, I wanna put all my trust in you and I wanna follow you and become a Christian. I'm telling you, it's a free offer. It was free to me. And I'm just telling you the good news, the sale's still going. It's free to you. But you got to have enough humility to go, I know that I haven't lived right, and I need to do it God's way, and I need to follow Jesus. That kind of faith is enough to save you, to rescue your interior world, the soul of who you are. Everybody's eyes are closed in this moment of prayer, but if you came in tonight and you go, man, I would love to be in on that prayer, Pastor, because I am not there, but I need to be there. I need to... Become a Jesus follower. You get to be in on this prayer tonight. What I'm going to ask with everybody's eyes closed is that you would just stick your hand straight up in the air. If you go, Pastor, I need to pray that and start that tonight. A relationship with God. Come on. Thank you, my friend. Anybody else? Just stick it up high so I don't miss you. Thank you. Thank you. Come on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So amazing. Y'all can put your hands down. I want us as a whole church family, would y'all look at me for a second? This is maybe the most important prayer that like six people are gonna pray in their whole life tonight. And I think it'd be awesome if with just a lot of faith and, and, and gusto, is that a good word? That we would just all pray this prayer together with our six friends that said, I want in on this. So I'm gonna lead us out and I'll just, just repeat the prayer, but make it from your heart tonight. Especially if you raise your hand, come on. Jesus, we come to you tonight. We're gonna put our trust in you. We believe that you are the son of God. You are the gift that God gave to save me. I'm going to put everything I got on the table. And I need you to forgive my life for where it's gone wrong. And starting today, from this prayer, I'm going to start following you. I'm going to make you the most important person in my life. Come on, in Jesus' name we say amen.